just very quickly, if you, if you go to docs for the number four patient care, docs for patient care dot org, um, and I'll send this to Greg. And, uh, so, in fact, I'll, I'll attach a file so you can see the prescription, the physician's prescription for healthcare reform. And what it basically is, it's a series of, of fundamental changes. If insurance, medical insurance could be sold across state lines and reformed, remember, when you buy your car insurance, do you go down to your Sunoco station and say, I have insurance, change my oil, rotate my tires, fix my windshield, wash my car? Heck no. You buy insurance in case someone steals your car and someone crashes into your car and costs eight to $10,000 of damage or totals your car. That's what insurance, that's, that's fire insurance in your home. It's, that's what insurance, health insurance has completely been perverted over the years by the government and by the mandates in every state. So it's, it's a completely broken product. I mean, people are so disconnected from the cost of health care. And part of our reform program is, is people could have health savings accounts. They can have tax deductions for that. And the tax treatment of insurance and HSAs across the entire board, not just for big business, but for small business for individuals, was equal you would, you would get 25 million people back on insurance tomorrow. One of the reasons why that fluid number of 45, 50 million is going up and down, up and down, up and down is because people get jobs and they get insurance. Or they come into some money and they buy insurance. But the tax treatment is perverse. It does not work. It keeps people off insurance. So you could fix that just with tax treatment. But if you could do HSAs, tax deductible HSAs, and then the real insurance, it's the catastrophic, you know, you spend your first $5,000 on medications, emergency room visits, uh, x-rays, whatever, okay, and you've got a tax deduction for that or your employer gives it to you and you've got the HSA to spend, okay, then you have a, a much lower cost catastrophic insurance policy that, okay, you get cancer, you're in an automobile accident, you get hurt, you have a major disease, your child gets a, a bad problem, okay, then you've got the catastrophic coverage. That would lower the cost. And if you did all of that across state lines, now you've got, what's that thing that Obama loves so much? Competition. You have real competition in healthcare cost. And with that, suddenly, instead of an MRI having 80 price tags for Medicaid, Medicare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, the patient without insurance, who knows what an MRI costs? I mean, I have, to, I have to do some research to find out what my anesthetic costs the patient based on their carrier, their age, their, you know, it's, it's ridiculous if there was price transparency and competition could work within the healthcare market. It's a very, very, very viable concept. It is completely destroyed by Obamacare, okay? Tort reform is part of it. I'm not here to scream about malpractice insurance, you know, it's important that patients have recompense when they're injured. It's very important. I believe in that greatly. I do medical legal work. I help patients who have been injured. Okay? But the game that's played now probably cost America $80 billion a year in terms of behavior by physicians to protect themselves. It's a completely broken system. Every state that has had substantive tort reform has improved dramatically their supply of physicians, and the cost to the physician, which lowers the cost of running a practice and drives down the cost for patients. So tort reform, like in Texas and California, of all places, excellent tort reform. Okay. In Obamacare, those states are punished because they've had tort reform. Obamacare is an unbelievable gift to the plaintiff's bar. It was, again, one of those very unfortunate and, 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 and abusive parts of the law. Okay. Uh, can you go to the next slide? I think we're almost done. Okay, now you say, what about Medicare? What if 10 years from now, we transition 10 years from now, every Medicare patient has their own insurance that's paid for by the federal government based on what you've put into the system. You're entitled to that. That is an entitlement that has been around since 1965. That should never disappear. People in their senior years should have support for insurance, but it shouldn't be government-controlled insurance. You could, you could be price conscious, you could shop for physicians, you could know what things cost, you could use a government-sponsored HSA, have the catastrophic insurance, 
and cost control would be dramatic. Same with Medicaid. If you took people who are poor, who are disadvantaged, and you put them into the marketplace of health care and made them aware of cost, some of their behaviors would improve. There'd be benefits in every area of their medical care. Being a Medicaid patient is the worst thing in the world. It really is. It's, and, and Obamacare puts 30 million more people onto Medicaid. I mean, it's an unbelievable expansion of a bad, bad system, which is going to break the states in terms of their budgets. So reform in terms of market-based, but patient-centric, patient awareness and patient-centric reform is so positive. The problem is it takes the control away from the government. And that's what all of you have to decide about, which you've, I'm sure you've decided already, your vote in November is going to be based on this very issue. The fact that we need the reform, and it's possible, but only possible at this point. We're really at the last step to be done in a politically favorable environment. So I'm going to stop there and take questions if you have any. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Here, put a mic Who's talking? That young lady over there. Oh. Thank you for speaking to us today. It was very informative. Well, thank the best, you. Best I've ever heard, really. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow Doc's her, uh, website. Um, one thing that I was waiting for you to, to hear tonight was about medical malpractice. Uh, is that something that you think is going to need to be addressed to help with the cost? Absolutely. And I, uh, when I mentioned tort reform, that's, that's what I was talking about. If you could reform the tort law, which encompasses medical malpractice law so that there was a way of, 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 of taking care of patients who were injured and, and injured by, by physicians not performing correctly. Uh, then, then if you could do that and take away the, the lottery system of what malpractice law is for a huge plaintiff's bar, I mean, there are... John Edwards, you know, he, he made like $80 million as a, as, a, as a plaintiff's attorney for medical malpractice with obstetrical cases. He was vicious and cruel and hurt more people than he helped ever. And uh, this is the, these are the kinds of things that we could correct. And it would drive behavior. You could start in the medical schools in terms of, you know, why order... You know, three thousand dollars worth of test. Well, I, I, if if I get sued, I want to be sure I can protect myself. That's the worst answer in the world. Why don't you just order the correct test and not worry about that? And, and that's really that's really the issue. So yes, tort reform is critical, and it's not because the doctors are concerned about malpractice insurance cost. It's it's that most of us who oversee the healthcare system are really concerned about the effect. Of, of poor tort reform, of poor, of poor tort law, excuse me, sir. Rush reported today that probably 25 to 50 percent of doctors would quit practice if this went into effect. Mm -hmm. That would yeah. stress an already stress. Well, system. you know, part of, the, um, part of the questioning on the radio today was uh, about a report that came from uh, Doctor Patient Medical Association. It's a small organization that is kind of built on what, what we've built as Docs of Patient Care. And they had a, a study they did in, in May before the Supreme Court ruling that 83% of doctors said they would consider quitting if Obamacare is actually in place after January 1st of next year. Well, and then the, the, the two individuals talking about the radio, they, they obviously want to say, well, come on, be realistic. You're not going to, 83% of you are going to quit. I said, that's not what the survey said. They would consider quitting. And what that's really about is fear. It's fear that the doctor-patient relationship is going to be destroyed. So Russia's, Russia's comment is accurate that many of us would consider not practicing, particularly those of us close to retirement. Sure, I'll come back. I, I am 64 in a few weeks, and I'll be 65 the following year. And frankly, if, if we start moving toward all the horrible things that I talked about, I would, I would probably, just because of my age, not want to have to try to survive in the environment that's coming. Because not only will the quality of care be 
almost impossible to maintain. But the morale amongst physicians, you know, we're a pretty happy bunch. We, 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 we like what we do, we love what we do, and, and we're, we're blessed to do it. Uh, but if it becomes an agony to do it, and a constant fight with government officials, with police power, who can imprison us, and believe me, the Obamacare, the regulations in that law are very well written, that they don't have to prove intent for us to have an accusation of fraud. So we can go to prison just by being good doctors. You know, so yes, there will be doctors that quit. Interestingly, 25,000 new doctors arrive on the scene in America every year. 35,000 leave, and that's the demographics. Because a lot of us are older, you know, and, and medical schools haven't been built for 30 years. So, so there's a limited supply and there's an excess exit right now. Well, that number may go down to 20 in terms of coming in, and I guarantee it won't stay at 35. I think it's going to go to 50. So you may have a net loss from 10 up to maybe 15 to 20,000 a year. Well, in five years, 10 to 20 percent of your workforce is gone. And this law adds huge numbers of patients that are going to be paid at levels that don't even allow you to meet the cost of taking care of them in your practice. So access will be ruined. Just putting numbers on the books don't mean that they get to see the doctors. If there are fewer doctors and they won't take care of those patients because it's costing them money to take care of them instead of being able to run a practice and pay their secretaries and nurses, guess what? You've killed access. So the questions for a lot of doctors are, will I tolerate that? Will I do that? Many practices are running so marginal with high Medicare and Medicaid populations because the reimbursement doesn't pay the cost of taking care of patients. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a crisis that's here but it's a crisis that's about to explode, so it's a very good question. It's very accurate.